Before we start talking about your book, mm -hmm. uh, When We Speak of Nothing, could you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your name, what your background is, how you came to writing, and um, anything else you would like the audience to know about you? Okay, my name is Olumide Pukwala. I am of Nigerian German background. I grew up in Germany and in Nigeria, a few years in Nigeria. And um, I've been in London for 15 years, I think, and so quite a long time. I came to writing very early, or I was interested in writing from six years old, from when I was six. And I think it started with uh, loving stories. And when I found out, when I learned writing, and I found out that somebody constructed stories writing them, I declared that I would become a writer. And I know it's true because it was verified by a relative later on. So that's what I declared at six, and I became a writer. So I was very single track-minded in terms of what I wanted to do. Of course, I did many other things along the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's a sort of general introduction. So you knew from very early on what mm -hmm. you wanted to be. That's really impressive because I wanted to be a lawyer when I was six. I'm far away from that now. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really, really great. Yeah. I mean, I had a detour and wanted to be in theatre and I pursued that a little bit and nice. performance was part of my life. But writing was always part of that. Mm -hmm. And it just so then turned out that the writing was stronger than the acting. So I think I'm a strong enough performer when it's my own work, but I'm not a good actress or actor when it's not my own work necessarily. Right. So um, the passion was really, the deep l passion was for the writing itself. Okay. Right. So moving on to your book, When We Speak of Nothing, mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a bit about the book, like what it is about, what's the backstory, mm -hmm. and um, how did you come to the title? Because I was really taken in by the title, so mm -hmm. maybe you could elaborate on that a little. So um, the book is about two teenagers, Carl and Abu, they're about 17, and they're about to turn 18. And um, actually it plays not too far from here, in the King's Cross area of London, and it plays during the 2011 London rights or the rights that then became the UK rights and at that time I was working in a community center not far from here mm -hmm. um, actually in the area the book plays in and I was interested in how young people were looking at austerity measures at that point we still had the credit crunch which then became the recession and austerity measures so in that community center I witnessed a lot of concessions for young people being cut etc so I wanted to find a young perspective on these changes, on these things that were happening in society. And while th that was the premise for it. And I started, the f book is really about the friendship and how they navigate the friendship against the backdrop of many different issues. So in a way you can say it's a very intersectional book, meaning the characters have certain things to deal with or come from certain backgrounds, so they're intersecting issues in their, in their lives. But while I was writing it, the London riots happened. So that wasn't initially planned, and that became part of the book as, as self. For a very long time, the book was called something else. Okay. So it had a different working titles. And when we, when Cassava picked it up, and they thought that it would be better to find another title, and I had all these quotes that were the chapter titles, and. Mm -hmm. Chapter four is called, When We Speak of Nothing, We Don't End the Silence. And it was just something that was very, very um, evocative. So we had uh, maybe three or four, I can't remember the others. And that was the one that spoke mostly to me. I thought it was very lyrical, but also very significant for the book itself. Because there's a lot of silences, there's a lot of speaking, there's a lot of chatting. But there's, I think this, the most important scenes are defined by what is not said. Right. Yeah, so. That's really interesting. I just started reading the book, so mm. I'm not uh, that far into it yet. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I was asking myself, okay, what about this title? I was really intrigued yeah. because I really love it. It's really catchy and you're like, hmm, okay, when we speak of nothing. Right, yeah. okay, interesting. Um, so one of the central themes to me mm -hmm. so far is the platonic relationship between two adolescent black mm -hmm. boys or young mm -hmm. men, mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned, Carl and Abu. And the novel explores their relationship and the possibility of young men, especially black men, having a relationship with each other that is uh, non-sexual. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what interested you the most in this topic and why. Mm -hmm. Actually, Abu is supposed to be an Asian teenager, so Carl's right. supposed to be um, black of African descent and Abu's Asian. But many people read it that way, so okay. it, it doesn't matter. I think what's mostly important is that they're not classified white, so they're, they're men of color. And what's important in that is that in society, especially men, young men, 
of this age have a very bad reputation. They're always the roughnecks, we have knife crime, which we associate with them, and there's a lot of stereotypes. And when I worked at the community center, I actually saw a lot of really tender rituals and how they were engaging with, with each other. And it was, I was fascinated and um, really drawn to that. They were very tender with each other, and I wanted to explore that. The other side we don't see. So they might be super cool, you know, the Christmas clothes, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> just the, the language very sharp, but they take care of each other as well. And they know how to take care of each other, much more than society gives them credit for. So that was my interest in that, to show, and thank you for bringing that up, and really non-sexual. It's not about that. Nobody's trying to get with each other. It's just about, no, bro, you have to be there for me. That's it. You know, for brothers for life or something. And yeah, that's what I wanted to show. Did you find any like difficulties when writing these male characters and their relationship with each other as a female writer? Not so much, but I, I had a lot of people to watch, let's put it that way. Right. So, um, yeah, so I watched them and of course I took a lot of liberties. I don't know if it's true. I don't know what happens when they're in the room together alone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's invention and imagination. But I think I watched them for not just a couple of months. I worked in that center for a long time. So I had a lot of experience seeing them and experiencing them and them trusting me and talking to me in a certain way that I thought I could sort of you know, transfer. Right. So your personal experiences with them has really, with the men or the young um, mm -hmm. men that you worked with has really um, influenced the book. Yes, absolutely. Right. And inspired, inspired it. Yeah, yeah inspired. Exactly. They have really inspired. And, I would, and that's how it started. I was inspired. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's really great. I feel like we don't have enough uh, narratives like that, mm -hmm. you know, of like non-sexual platonic relationships between two uh, young men or even grown men, you yeah. know, and it's always like you said, um, they have such a bad reputation, even grown men, mm, you know, I especially non-white uh, mm -hmm. grown men. Yeah. And uh, then when it's so tender and vulnerable and honest, it, mm. it gives a child a different light and it makes them human, yes. which they are, but we yeah. are not always shown. Yeah. Um, another issue that I am personally quite interested in is that you raise in your book is the shameful environmental destruction in mm. the Niger Delta in Nigeria. So I wanted to know, um, why did you add that to the story? Mm. And uh, was it sparked by a personal experience, that interest in that uh, part of the story, or was it something else entirely? I really wanted to learn about the Niger Delta crisis, you know, in Ecoside personally. So I wanted to create a reason for me to go there and do research. And in a way, um, it's the London riots that got added later, just because they happened at that time. But the Niger Delta, that was the part I was going, always going to be part of it. That right. car was going to go there. And I did go to the Niger Delta, and it was very, yeah, it was important for me. I am of Nigerian background, but when I go to Nigeria, I go to Lagos, I don't see much. And I, I wanted to know, because I'm interested in, I'm interested in the environment, and I wanted to know, it's just a big thing. Of course, I know about all the, um, you know, I knew about Kensaro Riba and, you know, the um, court cases around Shell. And um, it, was a it was a very, very important time for me to go there. And I spoke to an activist there. So I was passed on from different journalists and finally ended up with a quite young activist who was of Ogoni, is of Ogoni background. And he took me around through oil spills and different sites. So I got a good overview of certain areas. Oh, that, that's really impressive. That mm. must have been like a once in a lifetime experience, right? It, it was, and that's maybe what, one, of the, one of the scenes in there with Carl that you might not have read yet. Um, that's a one, something that happened to me and then I sort of changed it around so that it could happen right. to Carl. But it was, yeah, I was interested. I right. thought it was important to know. Mm. So, um, you as a woman of Nigerian and German um, heritage, how were you treated, or how are you generally treated in Nigeria when you live there or when you go there now? And how were, how were the people behaving towards you when you did that research in the Niger Delta? Let's start with the second part. In the Niger Delta, it was a little bit difficult because I'm light-skinned. You stick out like a sore thumb, mm -hmm. or not sore thumb, but you out. So it was very difficult just to blend in and just, mm, I'm just going to check this. I drew a lot of attention to myself. So that was a little bit of an issue. So um, I was, approach was, and nearly robbed um, because of that, because there was no reason for me to be there. Um, in Lagos, I mean, I always, because I'm light skinned, I always people know that m my story is probably not fully Nigerian. And that's just how it's always been, but I'm a bit used to that because I've been in Nigeria since I'm a child, so 
you, yeah. It's just what happens. Um, how am I treated as a woman? I think because I'm a feminist, I'm quite outspoken, um, there's always a little bit of adjustment I need to do, and to, depending on where I am, and to knowing and finding my way around. And I'm not necessarily as free as I'm here, in, in London, for instance. But it also has to do with that I don't I go to Lagos, that I don't know Lagos well enough to be that free. So, you know, I need a lot more help getting around and etc. So it's not necessarily just the, the difference of the countries. It also has to do with my knowledge of na navigating and knowing where people are, not having, you know, a lot of friends there, etc. Right. How does that compare to your experiences of how you've been treated or received in Germany? You know, the f on the flip side now, yeah. you know, because in Nigeria, from what you've said, the the European ancestry mm. weighs down, mm. but now how has your African ancestry and parentage influenced your experiences in Germany? That's a great question. So even though I stick out in Nigeria, there has always been a big claiming. Nigerians love to claim. So you have a, you know, I have a Yoruba name, you know, my father made sure of that. So they love claiming me, you know, and, and it's a great feeling. So you, you, you stick out because you you know, my color is lighter. Mm -hmm. And then maybe people try to scam a bit more money out of me. But it is a friendly, you know, there's a friendly, um, yeah, it's a, it's a friendly thing. And in Germany, during my growing up, I don't live in Germany anymore, but during my growing up, I was quite racist. So in Germany, on the other hand, was always denying me my Germanness. Although I have a German passport, I speak German fluently, most of my you know, formative experiences are in Germany. So there's a huge difference. So Nigeria, yes, fine, in the market, my prices will be higher. But in the end, you know, people are proud that I, be, you know, that I have this name and you know, I, I come back and people love that. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Do you speak Yoruba? Um, no, not really. A very, very, very <laughs> little. When I go, I shape up a bit so I can, you know, greet and ask for a few things. But yeah. by no means can I really have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I'm always very interested in the experiences of uh, people with mixed heritage mm -hmm. because, like you said, in Germany, the reaction was more hostile and racist. Mm -hmm. And whereas in Nigeria, it was more like, OK, they claim you. But do you feel like you get privileges because of um, your white parent and your lighter skin? I and why so. do you think that is? I think so. I think there's a lot of colorism. So as a younger women, men were very interested in me and I don't think it necessarily had to do with my great personality. <laughs> Not a it had to do with <laughs> being light skinned and that being seen as something desirable. Mm -hmm. And as you know, so it's a mixed it's a mixed bag really because um and anyone who's known to Nigeria, you know when you're black black is not considered beautiful, which is complete, you know, internalized BS really. Um it also has, to, of course, to do with access. So, for instance, when I was in Nigeria, I, w I went to kindergarten there, or later I was there as a, as a um, teenager, and I went to the German school. So also it has to do with, with class and access, because having a German parent, I had access to other things because I was speaking German, you know? So it's, again, it's intersectional. It is, yes, I'm light-skinned, and that affords me maybe a little bit of more attention, but uh, mostly it's probably class and access to things that affords me a different experience. Right. So do you think um, class had an influence on your experience in Germany? In yeah, the same you know, way? quite interestingly, in Germany it's the absolute opposite. I come from really bottom of working class and very chaotic um, family uh, life, including uh, I was in care for, uh, for a bit. So um, every, th every advantage I had in Nigeria, mm. I did not have in Germany. Mm -hmm. So On it, top of the racism? On top of, uh, it, was, yeah. it was fairly racist, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, Germany, yeah. Let's leave aside the reputation it can have, but yeah, mm -hmm. even today. Have you been back to Germany yes, recently? Yes, I go regularly. I go, okay. you know, How, every how are things now? Like, when you go, how do you feel in comparison to when you were younger? Because um, I go to Berlin mostly and I go for shorter visits. It's very different, but I'm aware that we ha there's a huge problem with the far right coming up, like we have in many places at the moment. So. It feels very different. Also, I'm an adult. I can deal with things differently, but I am not working in German institutions. I don't actually deal with German institutions, so I mm -hmm. visit friends or I go to a festival. It's a very privileged yeah. sort of insular experience. Right. I'm, I'm very worried 
I don't, you know, Germany of all places cannot afford to have the same rhetoric that it had just recently. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very worried and concerned. But of course, not everybody is like that. So yeah. in my daily, when I'm in Berlin and walking on the street, my, yeah. it's completely fun. It's great. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know. Yeah, it's interesting when you say you don't work in or with German institutions, mm. and I feel like it makes a big difference. You know, you go yeah. there, you have your space, mm. and then you come back. Um, yeah, so how um, does, where do you feel most at home? In Nigeria, in Germany, or in the UK? Um, this question, I get asked this question a lot, and for me it's always been easier to live outside either Germany and Nigeria, and that made me feel um, more at home. And the reason is because then I can be both or all of that I am. And I've lived, uh, because I left Germany to go to Amsterdam when I was 20. So yeah. even then it was very relaxing because nobody's claiming anything. Nobody's denying me or nobody's claiming or nobody's doing anything. I'm just being myself. So I would say I'm, I am a Londoner. Mm -hmm. So proper, <laughs> I've been here for a long time. I write about London. I'm still really fascinated by the city. I think there's endless more years of fascination left for me. So for me, that's, that's home. It's, London is home. I understand that very well. <laughs>